Everybody, hello and welcome. This is the Brooklyn Rails 891st New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Marie Lorenz, Dana Spiata, and Gabby Collins Fernandez. And we're so thrilled to welcome poet Ma Shane Wynn here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Marie Lorenz is a Brooklyn-based artist who has been exploring and documenting urban waterways for many years. Her notable project, Tide and Current Taxi, is a relational performance art piece that uses the tide to navigate New York City. Her work has been exhibited in solo exhibitions at Albright Knox Museum, Everson Museum, and Jack Hanley Gallery. Dana Spiota is the author of five novels, most recently Wayward. She was a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, the, Ro the Rome Prize, the St. Francis College Literary Prize, and the John Updike Prize. She teaches in the Syracuse University Creative Writing Program. And our host today, Gabby Collins Fernandez, is an artist living and working in New York City and a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. Her exhibition, Very High Baroque, is on view through October 14th, 2023 at Nina John Johnson, Miami. And um, thank you all so much for joining today. I'll turn it over to you, Gabby. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all. Thank you, um, Carolyn, uh, Chloe, and Eleanor so much. Um, and also really what a pleasure to be here with Marie and Dana. Um, Newtown Odyssey is a project that I feel like I've been seeing pop up in relationship, especially to Marie's uh, social media and when I run into you in person for the past three years or something like this. Um, and one of the things about it, which has been so uh, interesting, especially as an observer who's had little contact with various uh, dress rehearsals and uh, other elements of its development, is that the more I hear about it, uh, like the less I continue to know about what it actually is, um, which is something that I think is kind of by design. Um, you know, it's a it's a huge enterprise, a collaborative project between Marie, Dana, um, musician Kurt Rowe. I don't know how Brody. to say it. Brody. Brody. Um, and uh, many, many others, uh, a, a group of instrumentalists, vocalists, performers, uh, guides, so to speak. Um, it takes on the form, I think, in a playful way of, of the Odyssey as a kind of uh, mythical touch point. Um, and I just wanted to maybe start off the conversation by asking you both, Marie and Dana, uh, to tell us what Newtown Odyssey is, uh, perhaps in a kind of limited and refracted way just to, to get us rolling. <laughs> um, maybe I'll maybe I'll say just what it is sort of physically and then Dana sure. can talk about the story. It's a um it's a an opera, a musical performance that's happening in the Newtown Creek, um, right along the shore of the creek in Massbeth. Um, and the audience is gonna be on shore and in boats. And the performers are sort of some are on land, some of them are on docks and piers, some of them are in boats. And um, the the performance sort of moves along the creek. It kind of moves upriver, um, only about three hundred feet. But the audience kind of follows, and the boats follow as the performance moves up. Um, and I design the sort of um, the the fact that we're at the water, but then also the sets. And um, and Dana wrote the libretto, and Kurt wrote this really amazing piece of music that. Um, that he's down there right now rehearsing with the performers. So what is it, Dana? What do you think it is? Oh, well, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, a kind of um, um, adventure tour of the creek, but even though you're only going 300 feet, um, <laughs> 
Um, and you meet these sort of uh, people on the creek. Uh, there's a um, there's a there's some tour guides that are taking you, and then you meet um, a citizen scientist and the citizen scientist assistant, and they seem to be. Uh, benign, but maybe not. And then you meet um, some developers who are pitching um, a uh, very expensive uh, apartment that they want to build on the Newtown Creek, and they want you to buy shares in and or buy apartments in. And then there's um, an, a ghost of a 19th century um, sort of uh, waste uh, merchant. And, uh, and then you sort of meet the creek itself, which Marie can talk more about. But um, all of these things we came up with together, and um, and then uh, then they sort of um, met with reality in some ways, which were you know how do you do this thing um, and have these musicians and have this environment. But the thing that we were most interested in, I think, was just getting people to the creek and experiencing it um, and and. Uh, sort of paying attention to what's around you while you're there, because it is such a complicated place. It's a really complex uh, waterway, industrial waterway. So that's, I think, the thing that drew us to it, right? Yeah. Um, so there's so much to discuss about, um, about what this is and how it's kind of come to fruition. And I was wondering if you might talk about your relationship um, and perhaps the relationship that you've had with the other collaborators as you've developed this. Um, Dana, you wrote an article for the New York Times Magazine about traversing the Erie Canal with Marie uh, more than 10 years ago now. So it's a long yeah. relationship. Um, but I was wondering how the two of you met and how this sort of group, uh, you've described the Newtown Odyssey as coming from a group of friends um, and the the kind of the intimacy of the relationships also shaping um, many elements of the project. And so I was wondering if you could tell us about uh, maybe your friendship and your collaboration over time. Well, um, Marie is kind of my hero, so we'll start there. But um, <laughs> I met Marie. <laughs> I met Marie at the American Academy in Rome and Kurt was also there. We were all fellows at the same time in uh, 2008 and 2009. So we spent a year together um, and that's how we met and then uh, and became friends then. And um, we didn't collaborate till later um, when I, I was um, wanted to write an article about the Erie Canal because um, I live in upstate New York and it's around and I live near the Erie Canal and I was sort of interested in the old canal as well as the current canal and the ruins of it and uh, and Marie is this very you know um, the tide and water the, the the tide and water taxi is that the correct name yes tide and current taxi but tide and current yeah, taxi yeah, yeah in which she you'll she'll tell you more about it but she does take people on trips around these waterways in New York mostly New York City and the Hudson um, and so I thought, well, this would be the perfect thing would be if Marie and I did this together. So uh, the canal was actually closed. So the, none of the locks were working. So we took Marie's homemade, you know, her handmade carved boat, little boat. And um, we went on the canal, which illegally. And that's the thing about Marie is she always <laughs> has me doing illegal things and dangerous things. And that's what I'm really I love that about Marie because it sort of pushes me to some to to take risks that I, I you know, that I don't usually take and uh we camped and we stayed in a little inn and we kind of like got and we would pick the boat up and carry it over these locks that were closed so we could get from one place to another um it was it was really fun and then um and you put it you wrote you took pictures of it for your blog and um wrote about it and then I wrote about it for the the, the magazine the New York Times magazine and so that was really fun. I think there's a part that both of us are really interested in these things that are in plain sight that are around us that are contained so much and that we don't really engage them. And also I think with Marie in particular, this idea that we have, we have, everyone has access to these waterways and we're discouraged from using them or we're, we're meant to think that we can't go in the water and we can't do these things. And so I think there's that sense of, there's something subversive about the way that Marie looks at um, these industrial waterways that I think is really compelling. Yeah, that was such an influential trip when we went in the Erie Canal too, because 
I feel like I had never really thought about it. You know, I center the tide and current tax here on New York City. Um, there's so much to explore sort of just in the, um, you know, in the harbor. But then because of Dana's research about the canal, I, um, I, I got really interested in how the, um, how the canal sort of formed upstate New York. It sort of changed um, the, the, the whole kind of, I don't know, um, I don't, America as a, as a sort of a global um, player in sort of international commerce, because now we could take things down the canal to, to New York City. And um, it was just a cool, a cool, like, you know, bunch of research that you had done, Dana. And then I did a whole trip, I think because of that trip, just sort of like realizing about the canals, realizing how much, um, how interesting that was, how cool it was to sort of visit these little places that it's not even, it's like, it's cool to drive across the country and go to like weird little like towns that you would never have gone to, but this isn't even like those roads don't even go to these towns. This is just like the canal went there and then it, and then it sort of didn't. And then, and then the town sort of still exists. And so it was cool to explore these, um, these really interesting um, areas. So I did a whole trip after Dana and I did that, like maybe three years later, I did the whole thing as part of a show at the um, Everson Museum in Syracuse. Um, so it really, uh, I, it kind of piqued my curiosity about that that part of the world. Well, it's really interesting to hear both of you talk about this um, in those terms, be and and the relationship to the tide and current taxi, which you've been um, which you've been doing kind of consistently over a, a long span of time now, Marie. Um, because one of the things about having having gone out, I still remember, you know, going out to like Jamaica Bay with you a couple of like five, seven years ago now, like a long time ago now as well. Um, and how like uh, the shift in perspective as a viewer, right, as as a participant on the boat is so profound, right? Uh, because you can even know things about uh, what you're talking about in terms of the Erie Canal um, and how it was designed to move goods. Um, but it turns out that like that part of the waterway was never meant to be experienced by inhabitants, right? It was never crafted for like a kind of urban life or a kind of public space. Um, the way that we think about uh, like pedestrian walkways, roads, highways, et cetera. Um, and yet they do expose uh, so much about our usage of the rest of the city. And so, uh, for example, like even on that short trip, it was really clear, you know, like how much, um, like how much detritus was just, had just washed onto the shores of these sort of islands. And also what weird ecological formations um, exist there and like who had left random other boats um, on various islands, right? So there's there are all of these different kinds of traces of usage that become available um, from the shift of perspective of the viewer. Um, and it seems like uh, I was just, that was sort of a way of opening up uh, the question of the tide and current taxi in general. Um, and your, maybe like your your history as a sailor, Marie, and um, you know, which is, I guess what you are in some ways. Um, and like how you started thinking about the waterways and maybe how Newtown Odyssey has come out of the tide and current taxi. Uh, a mariner uh, says, <laughs> I know right, sailor's yeah. not the right word. As someone who's neither, my apologies for the lack of language. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was wondering if you could just talk about the tide and current taxi and uh, it's uh, maybe it's evolution into Newtown Odyssey and maybe even some differences for you between the projects. Yeah, I start, so I've been doing the water taxi, um, the tide taxi since 2005. And it's, um, it operates like a taxi, except that um, you tell me where you wanna go. And I study the tidal charts of the New York Harbor and tell you when the best time to go based on the tidal current. And, um, and I've been, and, and then I take pictures of our trips and we, um, I make a blog about it. And it's really the, um, you know, I, uh, and then there's sort of like permutations of it, like when Dana and I did the Erie Canal and we, um, there's sort of like extensions of it that sort of follow that same theme, like making a, making a journey and then, um, and then making a blog about the journey through, sort of through the, um, 
the eyes of the participant or the eyes of, I try to sort of tell the experience of the, um, the person that came with me. Um, and, and it's really sort of like what Dana said, it's like about being in these spaces that belong to us, public spaces, um, and just sort of occupying them, being in them in a weird way. I always, um, whenever I'm out, and also we're drifting, like we're not, it's, it, sometimes it's hard physically because the wind comes up and we want to get back to the land or there, or it's just hard to be outside all day. It's sunny. Um, it's hard to sit in that shape vessel. Um, so there's some, so there's some kind of, uh, it's sometimes it's physically challenging. It doesn't have to be like we can, um, we can work around uh, lots of like, lots of physical challenges, but um, sometimes it's uncomfortable. And I think it's, but we're floating. We're sort of using the tide to push us. So it's not, it's not like a sport. We're not, um, we're not trying to like work out or something. We're just sort of trying to be in the, be in the water and, um, and sort of experience what that's like. And I think that the, um, that the Newtown Odyssey is sort of a permutation of that just in terms of like um, being in the, in the location and sort of seeing what we see uh, letting the kind of flow of the um, of the waterway sort of dictate what happens is a big is a big part of the Odyssey. Of course, we've layered all of this other stuff on it, sound and a story. Um, but I but for me, really, the um, the you know one of the most important parts is just people seeing the area. And that's actually the slide that it's on right now is the um, is the place where we're doing the Odyssey. It's a little park that is um, in Massbeth. And it was just a where a street kind of ended at the at the water, and um, the Newtown Creek Alliance has turned it into a little park, um, and you can see the kind of you can see like sort of the sanitation department uses that area as a parking lot, and then there's just that little cement bulkhead, and the whole performance takes place almost within the that's the that's the 200 feet that you travel that you're looking at right now in the um, in that picture. And so mm -hmm. there'll be an audience of boats that are kind of in a, you know, arrayed out a, away from that, um, that site. And then the audience on land will be kind of tucked back in the, um, against the rocks and up on top of the rocks and stuff. The way that you're talking about, um, you know, like this relationship between site and what's happening there, uh, like it makes me think about the way that um, art, or aesthetics, for lack of a better word, can become like a framing device that allows public space to become visible, right? That like uh, the performance itself is the, 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 the stage, right? Becomes the framework where we are able to see the thing, um, which we might not even if we were just on a walk there, right? Um, that having this framework is in fact incredibly useful uh, for identifying the space as public. Um, and I think in some ways your work has a really kind of like interesting, um, maybe like semi-contentious relationship to performance um, as, a, as a kind of genre, uh, because uh, there's so much um, that just comes up, right? And maybe this has a relationship to some of the sound elements of the piece as well, right? The inclusion of the environmental aspects of Newtown Creek, um, the smell, which might be part of the scenario, right? It's history uh, famously as a super fun site. Um, and uh, yeah, I was wondering maybe if you, if, uh, if this is a good time also to talk about theater, right? Uh, you've chosen this really kind of like bombastic format for this opera, which has sort of notable kind of ties to both high and low art. Um, the Odyssey itself, which is, uh, you know, like a canonical classic, but which, you know, during the time would have been seen as a kind of public, uh, having a relationship to, to public performance. Um, also something that would have had to be performed itself orally, right, um, in, its, in its conception. Uh, so I was wondering if y'all could talk a little bit about theater um, and the relationship to the theatrical that you're taking on in this project. Do you want um, to talk about that, Dana? Sure. <laughs> uh, I think I just wanted to go back to one thing that Gabby said about how your perspective changes. I think that's such a crucial thing um, that I was thinking about, which is that, you know, when you're when you're down by the edge of the water or if you're in a boat on the water, um, your relationship to 
uh, Manhattan and to the city as you know it really changes dramatically in your relationship to the to the creek itself because you will you all your senses are going to be um, we you know you're smelling a lot of bad smells maybe <laughs> probably uh, you're going to see a kind of um, sl uh, you know oil slickness on the surface that is a, a sign of the the still um, you know polluted areas of the creek. Uh, and, and a lot of detritus that's in there. Um, but also you see this incredible reflection of the sky and the city in that in those kind of um, reflections in those pools. And uh, so there is this kind of uh, tension between things being um, beautiful and being ruins and being uh, contaminated and being, um, but also being remediated. There's all these stories going on, all these tensions. So I think, that does feel very dramatic to me and very theatrical. I think that the Newtown Creek is a very dramatic theatrical place. And, and the fact that you're, you're, you're doing this intervention, right? You're putting on the show, but there's so many factors that we can't control. We can't control the weather. We can't control the sound of, of you know, that somebody comes by in a boat. It's still a commercial space where there's commercial activity going on. And, um, and so uh, I think it, it makes all of the uh, people who are participating in it really participants because they're trying to figure out what to listen to and what to look at. And even within the performance itself, there's you could you could just look at some of the and when I was watching the version we did of it last year, there's you want to see it multiple times because you cannot pay attention to everything all at once. It doesn't have that kind of center to it that you might see when you see a a. a a theater on a stage where you're where it's very clear where your eye is supposed to go and where you're supposed to attend your attention is being pulled in in many directions i think and all your senses are being engaged in different directions and so i think it it does really make um i hope everyone feel that they're part of it uh it doesn't feel like the line is very clear um what are you supposed to look at am i part of it you know as i'm standing there and you are because you're being and you're directly addressed by some of the characters many of the characters so yeah, and that's what I love about the libretto that Dana wrote because we were, um, I, I remember sort of talking, it seems like we we spent months and months sort of like talking about what the story should be, what, who are the people, what are you, um, and when you came up with that idea, Dana, that there's sort of this, I don't know what you would call it, but like a conceit or something that, that, that um, the guides, that, that you're on a boat tour and that the guides of this boat club are trying to talk you into this boat tour and that's sort of the beginning of it and so what you said Dana about like the audience is also in the piece is really true for the um the people who have tickets to go inside the North Brooklyn Boat Club canoes because that's kind of the um they're part of the the play in a way because the the first song is kind of sung to them and the whole idea is that the entire audience is sort of on this canoe trip because they've been talked into the um They've been kind of talked into it by this boat club. Um, and so I love the libretto because it's sort of like it, it, um, it, it I don't know, it, it sort of fantasizes about this kind of very everyday occurrence or something. Because the boat club really does take people out on tours. And, but this boat club sort of has like a little, I don't know, like a, a little trick up their sleeve or something. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, there, there are definitely, um, characters that don't want you to be there and so right. <laughs> so that's maybe one tension too is that we are we're we're in this space that's already been sort of violated and degraded for you know over a century centuries and um and still uh so what what are what's our relationship to the water and what is our relationship to this kind of um canalized industrial space that's been um you know it it's has the sewer overflow that goes into it, the raw sewage when it rains, it has the it has the oil spill, it has um, you know, industries that have been dumping things in it and still has all those chemicals and buried in layers in the bottom of it. And yet it has people who boat on it and people who walk along it. There's the beautiful nature walk and the Newtown Creek Alliance and people that engage it. And what are the ways that we can engage the natural world in the city? And what's our and how can you know um, how can we also just ex understand and accept the cost of what we we do? I mean, there's this beautiful city and, uh, and this is kind of the bowel of the city, right? So it's just really, <laughs> it's, 
the relation, you can't have one without the other. Um, and so that's just something to sort of, um, that you can't escape when you're there and you're thinking about um, all the waste that has been um, put into the canal for so long and you can smell it. So you're present to it. So I think that's a big, big part of it is just sort of uh, in, you know, the, and the characters will mention those things as well. Um, so, uh, so I, th I think that, that, that's kind of, and it's all very fun and satirical and sort of, and whimsical at the same time. And as to what you were saying, Gabby, it is definitely, despite that it is, yes, that there's the Homer reference in the title, but it is a very low, and it is sort of, and it is opera, but it is also very, um, I think, yeah, the, the more of the low than the high, I would say, in the high-low equation. It's interesting because it's like, like many of these sort of older formats, right? Like um, that we now, that because of like, uh, because of anachronism um, have come to seem like they're high because we don't have the same kind of access to them. Um, like they were also sort of uh, middle brow popular vernaculars, you know, at, a, at in the time of their making almost, right? Sort of right. available to be consumed. Um, and I also think that there's, uh, you know, hearing you talk, Dana, and, and reflecting on uh, sort of Marie's work as well, um, something that I think is maybe like an important, uh, maybe side note, but kind of like subtext to the work, uh, is the idea that the urban space is in fact still natural space, right, that this distinction that people maintain between like you know, the city and like escaping to nature or like going away to be in nature is in fact some, that's the fantasy, right? Um, that like the city itself uh, still has to contend with the environment that encases it. And that it's also like, you know, there's water underneath, there's rocks like underneath building, there's like, you know, weather systems around it and literally just um, you know, like uh, descending 10 feet off of the side of part of the island, you know, part of the, the edge of the water puts you inside of um, a different kind of system, uh, which itself has also been altered by humans, right? The canals have been built, right? The cities, uh, you know, there have been tunnels made and, you know, the river has been adapted in certain ways. But um, I'm, and this is more of a kind of response to what you were talking about uh, than anything else, Dana, but it seems as though that's like a part of the, the project, right? To kind of collapse these distinctions that we um, hold separate for, for reasons that are uh, like maybe only conventional, right? That they kind of allow us to uphold uh, false illusions about the world, that nature and culture is perhaps one of these also like high and low is another one of these, that um, the beautiful and the toxic may be another kind of dynamic. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely, Gabby. And I think at, when you think about Marie's work, I mean, so much of the of the sets and things that she has made, I think you saw in those boats in that slide, and you can see here in this picture, but a lot of things that, that Marie does in her work um, is use, using a lot of found things, you know, sort of de the garbage and detritus that she has found in these waterways and repurposing them and into art and into, in this case, uh, boats and instruments and um, sets. Uh, so a lot of the stuff, I mean, maybe Marie could talk about that, but I think that kind of salvaging is really appealing to me because I feel even as a writer, you're doing a lot of that. You're taking something and putting it in a different context and changing. Uh, and, and you hope that the, that familiar object or that thing that we think of you sort of um, people see it in a new way. And now whenever you walk by the Newtown Creek, you'll never look at it the same and you'll see some piece of garbage and you'll think, oh, Marie would turn this into a beautiful, <laughs> it's kind of beautiful, those plastic bags that are hanging there. Um, so I, I don't know if Marie wants to talk about that, but I think that that's a big part of it for me. Yeah, the, um, if I could just say, that, so we're looking at, in the images before we were looking at, as Dana said, we did a, um, a version of the performance last summer and actually the summer before that too, so 2021 also. And, um, and we've sort of been growing the production as it's, as it's going along. Um, and so that 
it, so some of those images are from these like sort of public workshops that we did down at the site and also um, on, on, the, on the Hudson River. And then now we're looking at some of the sets and things that will become part of the um, part of the production this time. And this whole this is like where the scientists, where the the citizen scientist works. And this uh, this is now out on a barge in the um, in the Newtown Creek. All this stuff is like floating off the shore of the Newtown Creek. Um, but I wanted to go to something that Gabby said about the um, about the sort of that natural cultural or city um, city nature divide. And it's like being out at the site so much because I've been down there like building the docks and building sort of these like docks where the perform where the audience will be. Um, I'm I'm down there like you know week after week, and like it's insane how much stuff is out there. Like I've been seeing the most, I mean, I, I sort of like knew that there was crabs and things in the new tongue creek, but there's like insane stuff. And these got these kids have been walking down the bank and fishing off of the dock that I built. And they, in the past three days, they pulled like an 18 inch striped bass off the dock and they pulled a two foot eel out of the water too. And like, I had no idea that that stuff was down there. It's big. It's like big stuff is in there and then tons of little fish and you can see these cormorants fishing and they're fishing right around the, the ruins of the old plank road bridge and i'm like oh my god now i know what they're going down there for there's eels down there they're eating whole eels it's just like the most insane and you'll see um, osprey and um you know tons of seagulls and stuff but it's just amazing how being in that and then the other thing about the sort of um about the site is that you can also see there's all these muscles in the rocks right there that the um the it's part of the turning basin so the the canal gets a little wider in that area and there it's one of the only areas where there's sort of a natural bank it's not really natural it's sort of it's called riprap like they 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 put basically like construction debris along the um along the side of the shore to be sort of like a flood prevention measure but it's natural in terms of there's not like a hard bulkhead that goes like directly down into the water. So it's unusual for, um, for, the, for the canal to have this like um, more natural bank. And uh, there's all these mussels that are in that, those rocks. And you can see the most insane thing that I never noticed before. You can see that the water, so the water is murky. It's coming out of the CSO. It's coming out of the combined sewer overflow. You can see that there's a lot of like, um, you know, uh, bacteria and things in the water that shouldn't be there. But then the, the, the like three feet right up against the wall, the rocks where the muscles are is totally clear. Like the muscles are fixing it. There's like, and you can actually see that difference between like the murky water out in the deep part and the, what the muscles are doing. It's just like, I don't know, there's really cool. And I've always heard that. It's like, it's like what you said, Gabby. I've always heard that oysters, mussels, bivalves clean the water, but you can fit, you can really look in the water and you can see what they're doing. I don't know, it's kind of cool. It's and then these are these pictures are from sketches that I made for the um, for just sort of thinking about the opera. I made them a couple of years ago, kind of thinking about what kinds of uh, what kinds of uh, objects, instruments, and um, and sets would be in the opera. Um, I was going to ask, sort of as a as a tangent, and but also kind of like building from um, from what you're saying is Dana. I was wondering how um, like how how you wrote the libretto and you know it seems as though like writing for characters inside of this kind of maybe um like a uh, sort of loosely organized formal opera sort of has a relationship to um you know a novel like sort of a larger format novel and also a uh, kind of short story building both of which are formats that I know you've worked in um so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um how this, how the writing for this, uh, for Newtown Odyssey relates to your previous work and maybe some ideas that you've brought from um, some of your writing into the space of the opera. You're muted though. It was really challenging because uh, I hadn't done that before. And Kurt, uh, who's the, we haven't talked about the music, but I feel, you know, the thing that was reassuring to me is I think that the music and the visuals are more important than the words, honestly. No. And, um, <laughs> well, and, uh, and I felt, you know, and Kurt was like, whatever you want to do, I can, you know, I can work with. And so I just, um, you know, I, I really uh, did some research in my, my idiosyncratic way, which is to just read some books and take some, um, you know, trips on the creek with Marie and uh, spend some time at the creek and but and there's also a lot of great 
people um, who have, who think about the creek a lot. I mean, I think the person who's, uh, this guy, Mitch uh, Waxman, whose book I have right here, is uh, kind of the genius of the creek, I would say. And he's really, he has a really cool blog about the creek and all the lore of it. And so there's so many, so there, I was kind of just looking for language. So whenever I had the character, like I knew with the developers, I just watched a lot of uh, proposals for developments and got the language and the way they talked about it. And I just kind of found the language that I fasten on that I find fun or interesting and arranging that language for their songs. And so for the uh, ghost guy, that was really fun because once, you know, I heard about the like the night soil business and the rendering of elephants and then the varnish and the Vaseline factories, all the different things that they made on the creek it was really fun to say, oh, I wanna put all these things in, in the song. And then once I had like, oh, they made gelatin, I started thinking about, okay, like in the 1890s, what would they use gelatin for? And then I was thinking, oh, they'd use it for aspic and they'd use it for Charlotte and they'd use all these. So it was just really kind of fun to use the, the, the history of the Creek the, and, and, and of New York and, and find language that was fun for me to put in, in and then that is very similar to how uh, I write fiction, which is that, you know, really kind of language is the entry point and, uh, and then the language builds on itself. Um, and so there's just, you know, kind of collecting of, of words. And also that was the same with the, the Newtown Creek Alliance has a lot of great stuff about all the contaminants that are in there. And, um, and so just like listing all the chemicals and all the different, and then also uh, Marie had listed all, had gave me the names of a lot of the wildlife that are there. So, and then, oh, it's fun to sort of uh, take the, the flow of the language and you mix the contaminants with the beautiful, with the cormorants and you can put them together in the same sentence, just like they're the same in the creek. So that's really the way that I thought about it. Mm, I know that um, this is sort of like uh, unreleased, but a, a kind of small pitch for a later uh, bomb interview, bomb magazine interview that'll be coming out between you, you two and Kurt and David Humphrey um, at some point in the fall. Um, but I know that in there- I think it's actually coming out, I, th I think it might actually come out on the 8th or something, right? Yeah, it's, it's coming out. Oh, yeah. so Great. We thought it was gonna be after the opera, but it's actually gonna come out right before. Like right at the same time, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you sort of, you talk about like the form of the list um, yes. and the form of the list, which I guess in, in the, in the interview, you talk about Ulysses, but of course, like the list also has like plays a huge role in Moby Dick, right? There's this like kind of long tradition of like uh, lists as poetry, like lists as concrete poetry in relationship to industrial production <laughs> or something. Right. Like this. right. Um, it's that, that accumulation. Yes. And, yeah. and it's kind of like a, um, Lists are kind of a uh, poetry for prose writers, I think, you know, because I use because <laughs> you're paying attention to rhythm and you're and you're paying it and you're using repetition of syntax and form, you know, and all this stuff in a way that that's a little more stylized than when you're just writing um, maybe a regular sentence, right? So it's it's sort of like you know the the reader is sort of aware that a list was being made, and so they start to see relationships between things, um, and you can use that. Uh, to get these effects like putting uh, unlike things together or putting little surprises in. And so I was thinking about that a lot because I'm not a poet. I am a prose writer, but I do like to use lists in my writing. And I was thinking about uh, the great lists of literature. Yes. And um, and there's a great one about water in Ulysses that I, I used to read sometimes on, on Bloomsday when I if I ever had a reading. And it was so fun just to say the words because they flowed in this really surprising but beautiful way. And water is, you know, has flow. At least the Newtown Creek doesn't have a lot of flow because it really just has tide and it doesn't, <laughs> it it's, has some stagnation, but, um, <laughs> but, it, but yeah. Um, yeah, the lists were a big part of um, how I conceived of the, of the libretto. I was also thinking that the list, like a list becomes indexical, right? Because it has a reference either to um, like things you need to do or things that are available or components of, uh, you know, like uh, ingredients or something like this. Um, and that element of the list seems like it also has a really strong relationship to Marie's collecting of the objects from the creek, right? That there's this kind of narrative that um, refocuses us back on what is present 
um, even as there are perhaps more narrative uh, mythological um, elements in the in the structuring of the narrative. And I was wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, um, which as I was thinking about it, I was like, I wonder if like toxicity and safety also like made room for like magic um, because, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I was you know, like, safety <laughs> orange and safety yellow. Um, and then the kind of like, as a, as a kid who grew up in New York, uh, you know, like when I was growing up, it was like, be careful not to dip yourself in the East river, or like you might come out with an extra limb or something like this, right. That there's this relationship between, um, you know, the toxic, uh, even, you know, like even in popular literature, right. Like Godzilla, et cetera, right. Radiation. And the, the toxic adventure advent event, was it the toxic Avenger? Yeah. 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 And kind of like, yes. So I was wondering about the narrative and the mythology that y'all ended up creating for the piece as well. Well, Marie, I mean, we do have this this uh, Creek character at the end. I don't uh, that sort of it is supposed to be um, the all of the, all of it all together at the same time at this kind of essence of the Creek, uh, this uh, thing thing or being. And maybe Marie and you interpreted it. Um, you had to do the visual interpretation of this this kind of, um, I want, I, I felt it should almost be a transcendent sort of um, accumulation of everything. Uh, everything sort of um, toxic and beautiful all together, sort of ex a kind of acceptance. And um, and then Marie, you had this really cool interpretation of that. Maybe. Um, yeah, I like sort of, I like um, when, uh, when Gabby was talking about the list too, it's like the, um, it's it's almost like you got your grocery list, but then you kind of like mixed it up. It got kind of like crossed with your, um, I don't know, like a love letter or something like, and all, there's, there's something like sort of mixed up about it. And I like in Dana's writing, how there's sort of like a list of, you're, you start out with like sort of creatures, but then there's these like chemicals come into it too. So that, so the idea that like the lists have been kind of like blurred and mingled. And I think that that's kind of the cool, the cool part of the libretto and the, and the kind of like, you know, the complex part of the Creek is that there's not one, it's not one thing. It's not just polluted. It's not like, um, like don't, don't, I don't know. It's not like what you were told as a kid, like you'll come out with a third limb or something. It's actually, you know, like people swim in the East River all the time and they yeah. come out looking perfectly fine. They shower, but they come out looking fine. <laughs> and I think like, um, and yeah, and, but, and I, and I think this, this, the, the kind of story with the creek being is that I was thinking, you know, we knew it had to be like this, that's the creek, like the end, it's the end song. The song is beautiful. It's sung by the woman in those pictures actually. And she has just an incredible voice. And, um, yes. and, I, and I knew I wanted something to be like, what is the creek? Like we finally meet it. So like, what, what is the, this magical thing? And, um, and it, you know, I, we've known that there's a ending for years <laughs> and I was sort of stumped about what it was, like how, how it could be or something. And, the, and, the, um, and then a couple months ago I met, um, this woman who fishes for creatures in the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put her name in the chat in a minute. She has a really great Instagram too, Carolina. Um, I'm forgetting her last name, but I will find out. And, um, and she, uh, she has this really great practice, an, art, an artistic practice really of like capturing things in the creek and putting them in these tanks. And she does these really cool like Instagram videos about it. And um, she, her Instagram handle is Judith Priest with a period in between those two words <laughs> but she but she I don't know it's it's just like such an unusual um thing to get into and it's just like these amazing videos of like these little bivalves or like she found pipefish which is basically a seahorse and um all in the creek and so I was thinking like what if the creek being rather than being this like magical fairy or this sea monster or something what if the creek being was the fisher the fisher of the creek beings and so that's what the so that's what the end scene is she's um and that's why she's wearing sort of this high vis vest, and she's got this massive net in the um, in the in the in the opera. And so that's the, the the beings are, you know, she embodies them, but then she's also sort of collecting them. And I think it kind of, um, yeah, it's it it it's just yeah that that's that. I, so I just kind of ruined the ending for you guys. Spoiler <laughs> alert! <laughs> but it's gonna be great. There's stuff I'm not telling you. It's gonna be amazing. I said in real life, um, she also releases everything back into the creek, right? She that, yes, and also yes. returns. Catch and release. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
Um, I was wondering if y'all could talk a little bit about humor in this work, because um, it also seems like there's a lot. I mean, you've mentioned satire. You mentioned things being kind of like a send off or a send up of a lot of elements. And I was just wondering, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about this sense of humor, um, why it's important, where like what place you think it has and um, and all of this and yeah, how that works. Um, I mean, I think it just, it's not something I, I think it was just the way it came out. Honestly, it just seemed, uh, funny to me that, I mean, the, the idea that we're putting on the opera on the water is kind of funny. I mean, it's a kind of a, it's sort of absurd in a way and people are going to, you know, their feet are going to be sinking into the mud and they kind of have to give themselves over to it. So I think it is, I, I like the idea that it's going to be fun. Although I do think that, that, that the, that the one of the songs, the last song is a little bit more emotional, I think, um, you know, and because um, uh, there is something moving about the creek too. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, it, there is this kind of um, uh, a, a absurdist kind of goofiness. I mean, if you're going to have developers giving a pitch, it's going to, you know, if they're going to have to be a little ridiculous, come on. And this guy talking about his night soil business and all of that. So some of it was was going to be funny, but I also just think that, you know, we humans are, we are ridiculous. We are absurd. I mean, look at, we've, look what we've made. And so <laughs> I think laughter is a good way to, to engage that and to engage the audience, I think. I think so too. Um, I have one last sort of big question for the two of you before we turn things over to the audience. Um, and it sort of kind of came together as I was thinking about the Odyssey as a homecoming story, famously, right? Um, and the idea that like the focus that you've talked about um, on the creek as uh, on presence, on being able to observe what's there, um, and being able to get people literally uh, d down there or present with the creek, right? Um, that there's a kind of a physical movement that you're asking for the audience to undergo, right? There's sort of a short physical movement through, you know, the 300 feet of the land audience and some, some boat movement as well. Um, but the idea that there's a kind of return to a sort of observation of what's present, uh, which is sort of a guiding ethos of the project as a whole, um, which is also the loose, very loose narrative of like the kind of mythology of the Odyssey as well. What do we come home to? Um, what is it that we gain when we come home, right? Or when we come to the place that we are. Um, and it seems as though like there is a kind of, uh, like radical version of environmentalism, which you didn't invent, right? It, it sort of has a long history as well, um, which has to do with like seeing the places that we live in as they are and not as we wish that they might be um, and being able to be present with that. And I was just, I was wondering um, if you might talk a little bit about uh, your sense of either environmentalism or place or the kind of, homecoming that you're sort of um, home bringing, I don't know, that you're um, enacting through the performance or through the through the opera. I mean, I think what you said is you said you're so you're very eloquent, Gabby, and you said it really well. I mean, I do think that there's this um, there's an ex it's it's sort of see what's really there. And that means to sort of see what the the whole history of the place of of, of where you are and and what your relationship to it is, is um, I do think is a, important, you know, that kind of um, to arrest yourself and, and, and sort of engage in that way, in a new way. I do think it changes your relationship to uh, the world in other ways too. I mean, I do think that's kind of transformative. I do think that's a way that art can be kind of um, good for environmental purposes right which is that just in, in in a way that it enables you to sort of see the world anew and to sort of um see it with new eyes instead of just consuming it right and um and so i, I mean i would just say that that's enough and and it, it, for what art can do um i will say that that of course 
you know, I think it's hard not to be moved when you are there and when you're engaging it to say, you know, to, to be moved by people who are working very hard to make it accessible to everybody uh, and make it, um, uh, you know, make it so animals can live there and fish can live there and that the, and the, and, and, and things can grow there and, um, and the water can be uh, no longer contaminated. Um, and so I think that that's very moving. So I think, you know, I, I hope that part of what uh, just giving more attention to the Newtown Creek Alliance, because I think these are just amazing people are, you know, the, what they've done is amazing and what they continue to do. So maybe people will get involved or be more supportive of that, you know? Yeah, I think being down there, um, I actually confused like home. The other day I said, I told Kurt I was going home, but actually I meant the, the site because we've been going to like my studio, our house and the, and the site so much. I was like, well, I'm, I, well, I first have to go home, but I, anyway, so it has been, I've reoriented my idea of what my location is and I think like um it really has the um we have a intern from that that's like been been sort of like with us this whole time and when she started visiting the site she was like wow like this would be so cool if if, it, if you could swim here because one of the props for the thing is this sort of like lifeguard stand that's kind of in the rocks and she was like wow this would be so cool if you could swim here and that and that's I think the point the piece like why can't like wouldn't um why is it so, why let it be so um, so toxic and i feel like one of the unique things about the newtown creek itself is that you can't see it for most of its um for most of the time you uh oh it says my internet is slow i wonder if i'm freezing for you guys i'll just sort of push through it <laughs> um it's uh it's hard to see the newtown creek you um you are it there's lots of like con edison is along the banks there's a uh, fedex now is along the banks you're you're pushed away from it by industries that have that have kind of eaten up that real estate not because they're using the water but just because it's cheap the cheapest land and um and so the newtown creek is really working to sort of like um, balance that but um but people don't don't know it's there people live within or work you know within blocks of it one of the most alarming things is like when you're going down the street you, you see geese crossing the street um but you're in this like industrial area and it's be because the new town creek is like you know half a block away um so yeah i think it's i think it's about yeah like a, alerting people to the site the complexity of the site and getting people excited about like what we already have in the city which is this kind of amazing resource um and like asking more for and also, Gabby, it's not only that it, we're asking something. I mean, it's really actually hard, a little bit hard to get to the plank road where the show is. So yeah. they will be on a little bit of a journey. They'll be on their own odyssey just to get to the right. show. So. Yeah, that's a warning. It takes like a half hour to walk there from the subway. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I just wanted to, I know that, I don't know that we uh, said this at the beginning exactly, but I wanted to make sure that we say at the end that the Newtown Odyssey has, is happening on September 9th and 10th, as you see on the screen. It is sold out for now, as is the dress rehearsal at the Amant um, Foundation on the 8th, which is the night before, but there will be an Instagram live stream. Is that the word on the block here? Yeah, we're going to try. Basically, like, so the performance happens at sunset on September 9th and 10th. And we're gonna try to do this sort of dual Instagram live where if you tune in to Newtown Odyssey, what's our what's our handle? Is it Newtown Odyssey Opera? It'll it, it'll come up. If you turn if you tune into Newtown Odyssey, you can see what the what the audience is seeing. But if you tune into Marie Lorenz, you can see what what's like backstage because I'll be on the barge with the scientists, the the citizen scientist so you'll be able to see like the audience from the water um, which will be kind of cool and you can see all the boats and stuff so if you i expect that it'll be a little wonky like um and it's also an hour i think the performance is an hour and 15 minutes but if you tune in anytime around sunset i feel like you'll see something kind of interesting either at at my instagram or newtown odyssey instagram you'll see kind of like dueling um perspectives I mean, and there will be and there will be film of it eventually. right right yeah you can see it at a museum later 
<laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Let's hope. We're hoping for the Newtown Odyssey Whitney solo. No, I'm just kidding. But Maybe we'll, we'll do it again. Maybe we'll do it again one day um, if I don't die. <laughs> Um, well, I think that's it for the formal part of the conversation, unless Marie or Dana have anything they want to add, and then we can sort of turn it over to um, to, to audience questions in the rail from here. Cool. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this this conversation really. Um, what an exciting project. So um, we'd encourage anyone, if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, and I will go to our friend GE first for the first question here. Thank you so much for this look into this project. I only, only wish we had a little sample or some of the music or something, but but we'll, we'll quickly get to it. But it, it sounds like the power of the piece stems or flows from from the way it it need not choose between deep myth and social realism uh is there anything to this in the way it strikes that balance um yeah i mean i think it is pretty it is pretty broad i, mean, I think it, i wouldn't call it social realism because it is really um care you know these these characters are broadly drawn, I would say, because, you know, it is opera and it is theater. So and you you're not looking at a lot of like um, subtle finesse in that. Right. Um, and so I think it is kind of more on that side of things, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you um, so much GE, for that question. Um, and we just wanted to read, we got a nice comment in the chat um, uh, from uh, Lane or Laney who says, terrific conversation, have been following all of this from Chicago from, for some time as we slowly turn our Chicago River into a swimmable and vibrant body of water. All of this is deeply inspiring. Just wanted to echo, at, echo that. Um, and then I see one more question in the chat here. Um, Kathy, I, would you, I can unmute you to ask, would you like? Oh, I, you're just still muted, but you should be able to unmute. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry if you addressed it early on, I joined a few minutes late, but um, I just think that the process of how you guys did this long distance, um, just for anybody who's a creative person, how how you manage that and also what what came first? Like Dana, did you write your libretto to suit the score? Did the score follow Marie? You know, I'm sure your ideas of what you saw maybe beginning, middle, and end, or or what your goal was. I, did, did your instruments inspire Kurt? Or did Kurt's libretto inspire your instruments? Um all of that. That would I, I <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Um, so the way we did it was that we, um, it was Kurt and Marie's idea first. They were on the creek and they wrote me and said, Would, do you want to collaborate? And then we um, we ended up uh, having a lot of Zoom kind of brainstorming uh, because we thought that the story should come first. And um, and so they all, Kurt and Marie had a lot of ideas for that. And Marie actually made a board game. Can I, I, this is amazing. She made this beautiful board game. I have it up here, hold on. Of um, this beautiful Newtown Creek board game here that she made. And it has a map of the creek and little clay figures so that we could talk about it and look at the creek. And she made a glossary. I mean, it really Marie had a lot of things. And so out of all those conversations, um, we came up with the, I came up with the story and the characters, and then I wrote the libretto and Kurt just said that, you know, you write the libretto and I will write the music for the libretto that you write. Um, and so that's, that's how we did it. Yeah. And then, I mean, Marie and Kurt work very closely together on the actual production, which I can take no credit for that part of it. Yeah, it's been amazing working with Kurt this past couple of years on it because a lot of the things that have come out, a lot of the things that went into the iterations like um, last year and even the year before were these um, 
sculptures that made sound out in the water. And it was an element that I feel like used the, cause I've always like used, you know, ocean garbage and stuff in my artwork, but then making them make noise, make sound added this whole um, other dimension to the, to the work. And then I was making these little things last summer where there were these ukuleles. That's what's in one of those pictures too. There was these ukuleles where the motion of the waves was playing the ukulele. Um, and it, none of that's in the opera, <laughs> but it's all, but there's these other, there's this other sound producing elements in the, um, in this, on the scientist barge. And, um, but it was, but so all of these sort of offshoots of the opera have made, have made it into my sculpture and made it into other work. So it's been really interesting, like working with the musician and sort of thinking about sound and how, how that's really opened up. Um, yeah, opened up, I don't know, my own kind of process. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Kathy, um, for that question. Um, and thank you all again for this conversation today. Here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome Ma Shane Wynn here to the Zoom stage. Ma Shane Wynn's most recent poetry collection is Storage Unit for the Spirit House from Omnidon, which was nominated for the Northern California Book Award in Poetry. Wynn's previous collections include Invisible Gifts and two chapbooks, Ruins of a Glittering Palace and Score and Bone. Wynn often collaborates with visual artists, musicians, musicians, and other writers. She is co-founder of Maker Mentor Muse, a new literary community. Thank you so much, Ma, for joining today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. What an inspiring conversation. I loved hearing about it, and I wish I could go to it, but I heard it was sold out. <laughs> um, I'm going to share some poems. Um, I have a new collection coming out uh, next year on Omnidon, and I decided to read um, poems from the book. So thank you so much to the Brooklyn Bell for inviting me. Thought Log, Hula Mantras, Sacred Optometry, Lanai Euphoria, An Island Trickster Disappears with a Laptop. The memoir instructor announces guts on the table now. Testosterone descendants, anxiety, gratitude, barrier echoes. I conspired with the sun today. Tom Tom, timpani, Celesta, only wooden things always. Our memory concussion, all applause for the creator. Orchid choir, wave skate, grass bucket. Fake meat, pork chops, and white rice. The earth's hottest years on record. Found manifesto, desperation ceiling, storage unit. The universal is personified. And the title of this poem is The Thinking Jar. An antelope asleep in the wood. I shop for peanut brittle online, violet strings, a muscle prediction, an airport therapy session, or a clue to find sea urchins in the bow blue. I draw with blood these days, a pile of pink shells. I am a dram of neurotic fixes, hatchling in the parlor. Fingerling in the hot oil, fire ant eyes. I drop a shock of wicked white hair to the floor. A blackbird on the thinking jar. Wonder if I can swim from the Isle of Elderberry. And this is an ekphrastic poem and it's after Towards No Earthly Pole, an installation by Julian Charrier. Erratic, memory of sky. When you're standing on the ice cap. Punctured boulders where moss fires glow green. You're not standing, you're flying. We chop frozen entropy. We milk fossils blue. And this is another ekphrastic piece. Uh, after Literal Drift Near Shore, number 209, by Megan Rippenhoff. 
We're shoreline photosensitive denizens, silt blossom chrysanthemums, traced surfaces, cyanotype lit, scratched saline, sleet grazed through. We snap blue sand around my hand. We faint a little harder. And uh, my second last poem um, is called Wetlands. Otter and mink roam the fen. I don a vest of moss. Cormorants curlew call from the bog. I avoid the beehive. Sea trout, croaker, swim through the marsh. I consult my mood ring. How do I feel? Sedges and saltbush, the bobcats are disappearing. I cry at all the right times. And this is my final poem, and it's entitled Weather Log. Where's Dawn? She's at Lexa's house. Nerves permeate our air. I visit with a honeydew, last light dips through shutters. We make a sourdough loaf. Intertidal mudflats, wild saffron, swift wind. What is air, compressed breath? Crocus, heads, nests. Yvonne's rusty locks. My brittle nails, meadow burns. Gold flinches, we look up. Thanks so much for listening. Wow, thank you, Ma, so, so much. That was just um, beautiful. Yeah, really what, incredible today. Thank you all. Um, thank you, of course, uh, Marie and Dana and Gabby um, and, and Ma, yeah, it was just so such a wonderful way to end things today. Um, we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. Today's conversation has been recorded and will be up there shortly. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail and uh, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for I Only Know It in Fragments, a rail poetry reading curated by Ashley Escobar, featuring Edwin Torres, uh, Philip Marinovich, Julian Poirier, and Matt Proctor. And you can now all uh, turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you thank you so much. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Thanks, uh, that thank was you, so Marie. special. Thank you thank so, you. so much. And thank good luck with the performances this weekend. Thank you, yeah, all. Thank you guys this weekend, hopefully.